wait a minute. Be kind of awkward looking, but nothing to do about it. Um, okay, here's our outline for today. Uh, we're going to be studying Newton's laws of motion uh, by the end of lecture today. Uh, but before we do any of that stuff, uh, I want to give you a foreshadowing or a little uh, kind of a preview of how we handle formulas and formula sheets uh, on midterm exams and on the final. And I know a lot of people are, you know, are always asking, Dr. B, are we going to have a formula sheet for the exam? You know, can I make my own formula sheet? Well, the way that we, we do it is uh, with multiple choice uh, questions. Uh, but before I get to that, let's just review the SI schedule today, 2.30, 3.20 p.m. Um, teaching Academy. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock, uh, Business Admin Building 1. Make sure you try to go to those. We're going to have some homework uh, uh, tonight. So, uh, so as I mentioned, formulas for exam 1. This is, uh, in case you haven't figured out, when I just have some text on the screen, I like to put in an image that is interesting. This is a volcano down in Chile. Uh, there it is down there at the, towards the tip of South America. And here's there's a direct flight from MCO down at Chayton, about 5,000 miles south and a little bit east. But anyways, what we do uh, for formula matching or for formula handling on exams is I set up a little matching section at the very beginning of the exam. So the first mm, four or five questions, six or seven questions, depending, you know, depending on the formulas that you need. And then you do a little multiple choice uh, matching with that. And so it's equivalent to a formula sheet, but you get some points for recognizing the formulas for what they are. And so we're going to do a little practice with that with the eye clickers. All right, so here's what it looks like. Get your eye clicker ready. Let's see if I can operate this. Uh, this thing is really small. Okay, so uh, what we're going to be doing, we don't, th this is what it looks like. So I'll have a list of like three definitions uh, over on the left. And uh, let me do something here. Hold on. Let me get rid of my presenter notes okay let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger yes all right this is looking better now it's not perfect but okay uh, so here's question one um, and, and let me start the question, multiple choice. You're on frequency DD. Uh, so press and hold the power button for two seconds. And the rectangle on the upper left will flash. Type in DD if you haven't already. Uh, you'll get a go nitro message. And then, so which of these formulas, A, B, C, or D, is the definition of acceleration? Go ahead and vote for that. And this is kind of how it'll work on exams. You know, you have a list of, you know, here I've got three items. So three dots on the Scantron form. And then you have a list of formulas. Or I might make it the other way, you know, three formulas and then a list of five concepts. So it works either way. All right. So 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Three, two, one, zero. And by the way, good. Um, let's see what you guys voted for. Boy, this is hard to do properly. Uh, looks like everybody voted for D. And guess what? That is the correct answer. So let me grade that as correct. Okay. Um, Oh, 
what was I going to add? Well, I'll keep going. It'll come to me. Second question. All right, free fall position is a function of time, A, B, C, or D. All right, here you go. And hopefully this one's fairly, fairly righteous. This is tricky, though, this screen business. You know, my, my battery ran down to zero power, so that resets a lot of the settings, I guess, including displays. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. By the way, this is the first day of official participation. So the clicking that you're doing now is going to go into your semester grade. Um, better make sure you double. Pre I only got 67, 81 in the previous question. Uh, try to vote again. Make sure everybody votes. Okay, that looks better. 80. Um, yeah, so this one, let's see what you guys voted for. Uh, C is correct. That's the correct answer. Uh, so your um, mat, so your formula handling on exams, you don't have to memorize. All you have to do is recognize, and that is a slightly different task. And memorization, you know, I've seen students memorize a bunch of formulas and they start with the same like there, there's a formula for momentum that uses the, the symbol p p is the customary symbol for momentum and on the same test there was a uh, a problem where they needed the formula for pressure and so they didn't know which one they just knew p, p. and so they started using the formula for pressure in a momentum calculation, it got all messed up. So this one is a little bit better. It, it'll work better for us. Okay, so just put down etc. Um, so as many formulas as you need. And on this one, you know, there, there's a couple formulas that you you won't need on exam one. Like formula A, that's actually from the very end of the semester. That's the uh, De Broglie relation. So. Um, so that's how we do that. Now let's keep going into Newton's laws of motion. And to introduce the idea of accelerations and forces and stuff and go into a little bit more detail, I want to review this idea of hidden figures, that movie from a couple years ago that I really like. So now I have a short answer question. Hit the refresh key because you're going from multiple choice mode to short answer. So type in a word or a phrase um, that describes the motion for which this is the velocity graph. So look at it carefully. All right. Now you can't type in a sonnet. You can't type in a haiku. But you can type in a, a phrase or a word. I think the limit is 14 characters. Okay. So. And we'll take a look at some of your answers. Okay, so you go up and down, and then we got the letter you want, then you hit the right arrow key, and you type in the next letter with the up and down arrow keys. Hear all that clicking? Oh, it's not? Oh, uh, yeah, it would help if I start the problem. Okay. Hit refresh again and try. Better? It'll start you on the letter A, I believe. That sounds better.
What is it that you notice about this in a word or maybe a short phrase? And actually, there's a space in in the in the characters that you've got. You've got all kinds of characters in there. You can even write equations and stuff, simple ones. And then when you have your answer, your word or your short phrase, hit the send button. Okay, and I've got 18 answers right now. And we'll take a look at some of your uh, some of your answers. Okay, uh, 45 seconds, starting now. Yeah, so get your, your word or phrase in there and hit the send key. If you don't hit the send key on this kind of problem, uh, we, don't, we don't know what to do. 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, stop the question. Let's look at some of the answers. Uh, let's see if I can make this bigger. I can't. Uh, a rocket accelerating acceleration. Well, if if it's if it's changing, if it's going from low speed here to higher speed up here, yeah, definitely acceleration. But this could be a rocket. Uh, as the V if as time up point zero ascending. Constant, constant acceleration. That is incorrect. Constant acceleration is a triangle on the velocity graph. Is this a triangle? No, it's got the top of it's got a little curve to it. Exponential, exponential growth. Now that's some guys that have had biology class. Free fall, going up, increase, increasing, rising, shift up, slope. Slope is an important factor here. Speed increase, the time A. Uh, time increases with something, upward. Well, let's bust out of here and let's go and study a little bit more. Now we're gonna take notes on this. Make sure you have a good sketch of this and give it a little bit of a curve. Because what we're gonna try to do now this is the hidden figures problem from, you know, one of the things that, you know, Catherine Johnson and all those guys in the movie did uh, so dependably and so reliably. Uh, they figured out graphs like this. How do you figure out the area when the top of the graph, the graph itself is a curve? It's not a straight line. It's not horizontal. It's not tilted like a, a, velocity, um, a distance triangle. All right, here we go. Here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to put in a couple um, random times here. So here are the two that I chose. So some are kind of in the middle. Don't make them too far apart. Just put in some dashed lines up to symbolize um, a little slice of this velocity graph. And we're going to try to figure out how to handle the area of this little slice. All right. And just make them somewhere in the middle where, where it's big enough you can see it. Now, I measured these things really carefully uh, on my computer. 
So I can tell you that the first one is 90 pixels tall, and the other one's a little bit taller, 104. All right. Now you you know depending, go ahead and write my numbers in, and we'll work with my numbers. If you do something like this on your calculate or on your PowerPoint or Apple uh, Keynote, uh, you can get the um, the length of the the vertical length of the segment just like I did. It's not too hard. All right. So I you know so this is uh, a, a duplicate up here of the two line segments that I got. All right. Now. Those two babies form a trapezoid. So the area under the graph, it's not a triangle only. It's not a rectangle only. It's a trapezoid. And here it is over here to the right. Now, I also measured the distance between the two vertical lines. And so that's my elapsed time. So that might be 50 milliseconds. Uh, or some other, you know, depending on what my conversion factor is, but it's 50 pixels on my screen. So the left side is 90 pixels high. The right side is 104, and the base is 50. They form a trapezoid. Trapezoid is a quadrilateral with two sides uh, that are parallel, in this case, the two vertical sides, and the other two sides not parallel to each other. All right, now, what we're going to do with this now is kind of break apart the trapezoid, and we're going to do a, a clicker question. Now, hit your refresh key. Hit the refresh key. We're changing to numeric now. And let me get my... All right, so we're going to do a numeric question. How many pixels um, is the height of the triangle at the top of the trapezoid? Because a trapezoid, you can break it down into a rectangle with a, a triangle on it. In this case, the triangle's on top, little right triangle. All right, so how tall is that little slivery triangle? up? Now, I didn't draw it in, but you can draw it in if you like in your notes. Or just think about it, mentally visualize it. All right, how many? So give me a whole number and then hit the send key. All right. Uh, you got number? Did it start at number one? It should. I mean, if you didn't get the number one, hit your refresh key again. Question over here? Question? All right, we're doing a bunch of clicker questions today, and all these are designed to make you think. And that is what I want everybody in here to be able to do. I want you to be able to sit in the front half of the class and to think. Now, some of you guys back there, I can barely see you back there. No, I'm not. Don't look back there. I'm looking at you. <laughs> This guy in the back row, who those guys, there's nobody back there, man. I'm looking at you. That's all right. Just try to remember to sit up towards the front. All right. 20 seconds. Starting now. And definitely draw a sketch of this if you're drawing in your notebooks and stuff. 10, 9. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's stop this. Uh, all right, well, let's figure this out. All right, so there's my, here's my trapezoid over here. So the base we know, the base is 50. In, in fact, here's the rectangle. I, I, I made it in the right proportion, but I blew it up a little bit. Okay. But the proportions are right. 50, 50, top and bottom, 90, 90. And so that's a rectangle. Okay. So the, the triangle is right on top of that. It's kind of slivery. So the base of it's going to be equal to 50. So now you got to answer to yourself, well, how tall is it going to be? 
Okay, base 50 good, no problema. But the height, yeah, 14 pixels. Anybody uh, vote for that? Good. Let's see. Let's see how many people voted for that. Yay. So, uh oh, 50. You were thinking the base, and that's that's correct for the base. 104. See, look at this. This is this is indicative. 104. 25 to 1750. How do you get that? Oh, 14 times. No, that's 700. Well, at any case, 53.8. Um, the correct answer is, um, is uh, 14. So, so here it is. So go ahead and sketch them together if you like. If you got some room. Question. Well, the the left side. Let me go back. The left side is 90, and the other one is 14 pixels higher. Okay, so that's where the that's where the triangularity comes in. See, if you look over there on the right, this this trapezoid here, right here, this one it wouldn't be tilted. If the if the right side wasn't 104, if the right side was 90, it just you know nice and flat. But it's 104. It's not too tilted. But um, but yeah, that's how you, that's how you figure that out. All right. So there's my. So this is kind of, you know, this is kind of breaking it apart. You know what analysis means? What is your name? Jackie. Jackie. Jackie analysis means to break things apart. Okay, so what I've done is I've broken my trapezoid apart here into a good old rectangle, 50 by 90, no problem there. And then kind of process of elimination, all right, my leftover height is 14, but only on the right side. So, uh, so, there's your, so there's your trapezoid, all right? And make a note, you can now calculate the area pretty easily, okay? Uh-oh, do you see an error? Dr. B. Ooh. Dr. B. I did. I forgot a one half for my triangle. I've got 700. Let me fix that. Let me you can calculate, you know, one half base times height for the triangle and then base times height for the. And of course, those would correspond. You know, the, the height of 14, the height of 90, that would be like, you know, like maybe 14 meters per second if it were a real object and 90 meters per second, you know, because that's the velocity scale vertically. And it might be 50 milliseconds or uh, 50 uh, seconds, you know, if it's if it's going fairly slow. All right. Now, um, the other factor that I want to bring to your attention is the slope. The slope of this trapezoid, now the slope is changing. You can see that it gets steeper and steeper. It's pretty easy walking down here at the beginning, but as you get further along this curve, if you were a little ant walking up that curve, it would get tougher and tougher. Okay? And like many mountains, they get steeper at the top. All right? So the slope, which is rise over run, that's actually a, a significant feature here. And that would reduce to 7 over 25, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you can calculate the slope. And if you raise your hand if you've had trig class here at UCF or anywhere, high school, high school or, or here. Okay, a few of you. You know, rise over run, you can figure out the angle, the tilt angle and all that stuff using a little bit of trig. And we're, now, we're, we're not going to do that. but uh, you could if you wanted to. But if you know the slope, you can actually figure out the area of the trapezoid if you know um, just one of these two heights, you know, like 90 or 104. Uh, 90 and the slope or 104 and the slope and bing, you got it. All right. And you got to know the delta T as well. Question. Yeah, you're right. The question is, how can you how can you say why are you saying it's a trapezoid? Because it's 
the, the, the velocity graph is curved. And the answer to that is, yeah, it's an approximation. And in physics, this is what this is one of the things that we do. And I'm bringing it up because those guys down at, at NASA, at Langley uh, Research Center in Virginia, or up in Langley Research Center in Virginia, back in the day of hidden figures, they did it all manually. Now we got computers to do it. And but you know, it's called in calculus, it's called the trapezoidal rule. And the smaller you make the delta t's, okay, so put a star next to that formula. The smaller you make delta t, the narrower your trapezoid, the closer the top is to the actual curve. So the top is overestimating the curve, the area. Okay, so trapezoidal rule, you're a little bit more. So it's, you'd say, well, it's approximately thus and so, maybe a little bit less than that, because in truth, you are estimating a curve with a straight line segment. So good eyes on that. All right. So knowing the slope, and, and hey, you guys, this is what they pay all those PhDs uh, up at NASA Langley and down at Mission Control in Houston and everywhere else, how to figure out the acceleration. Because that's what this is. The slope of this line, um, as it changes or if it's straight, that is the acceleration of the system. All right? And knowing how to calculate the acceleration is what Newton's laws of motion are all about. That's why we're bringing this up. Now, these guys here, uh, Catherine Johnson, uh, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson in the movie, uh, and they're real people, um, uh, not just uh, movie characters. That's one of the things that they did. They Their specialty... Um, and along with all the other eggheads up there at NASA, uh, Langley was to calculate, uh, among other things, get that slope, figure out how, you know, figure out how your spacecraft is going to accelerate. Given the, the you know, the mass of the, of the spacecraft and its speed and how powerful the rocket motor is and stuff like that. And that gives you the slope, and then you got, and then, and then they say to yourself, "Well, we're going to use really small delta." They probably used a millisecond of time during launch, at any rate, and when they were on orbit, probably a second or maybe two seconds. But then, when they started to deorbit, they probably went to small, you know, maybe tenths of a second uh, for their delta t's. So, so let's wrap this together. Velocity graphs. Okay, simple rectangle, constant velocity. We know that one. Distance equals speed times time. Okay, we already tackled that. Distance triangle, that's for a smooth acceleration like free fall. You know where, like what Galileo was trying to study, Madison. You know, G is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second per second. Everywhere from the top of Mount Everest down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Okay, now if you're out further out in space, it's a little different. But if you're a human on Earth, your free fall acceleration is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. But, that, you know, that's not the only thing that you care about. If you work up at NASA Langley in Virginia, you care about complex accelerating systems uh, like uh, spacecraft. And you know what they did before that was airplanes. In World War II, some of our best airplanes were um, had really, really long range uh, co or combat radius, you would call it, uh, because of what they did up there to make the airframe more efficient, less gas per mile uh, at high speeds. Uh, so they they were doing spacecraft. So trapezoids all over the place. You know, most of those guys. I mean, if you could if you could take like a, an X-ray of their brain, you would see trapezoids everywhere. All those guys up there. Bunch of other stuff too. So small increments of time, and then smush them all. To, you know, do do a zillion calculations, and then add them all up, and that'll get you to your 
uh, final position or whatever, you know, the position at any time that you need, you know, and then it's okay. So, you know, like maybe your midway point between earth and the moon. And then, okay, so we got that. And then the, you measure them when the, when the astronauts are out there and they might be, uh, you know, 5.2 meters from where they're uh, supposed to be. So then you say to yourself, all right, that's pretty good. We'll do a little mid-course correction. So they fire their rockets for a second and get back on the, you know, right straight trajectory. So they got to do this all the time. And they got to do these, this hidden figures method all the time. And here's a picture of Katherine Johnson. And she is still alive and kicking. This is her getting the Congressional, no, not the Congressional Medal of Honor, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Long may she reign. What a story. And if you want, you know, the movie was good, but the book, I'm in the middle of reading the book. Uh, it's just a great book. Margot Shetterly. All right. Let's talk about accelerations and what causes them. Okay. Free fall acceleration near the surface of the earth. Constant. Pretty much. If you have an ultra, ultra, ultra uh, precise accelerometer, you know, like, you know what? Your, uh, tele your cell phone has a little accelerometer in it, and that's built to measure the acceleration of the phone at any given moment of time and then shut everything down quickly if it's over-accelerating. That means it's over-accelerating. That means it's getting bumped or something you've dropped it and you're going to over accelerate when you hit the floor okay so they try to shut everything down you can't shut everything you know you, you still might break the glass the phone will still work okay so 9.8 meters per second per second everywhere from the top of mount everest to the bottom of the deep blue sea okay some systems rocket launch you have changing accelerations. In other words, just like that that graceful curve that, you know, we were just working with. That is something where the acceleration is increasing. It's getting steeper and steeper. All right. So the space shuttle, it launches with a relatively small acceleration upward. It's less than a G. But, you know, as it gets higher up in the atmosphere, it's it's losing mass out the tailpipe and getting plenty of thrust upward from the, you know, rocket motor, all right? So as less mass um, is in the spacecraft, it develops bigger and bigger acceleration, plus the drag from air resistance as you get up in the atmosphere gets less and less because the air gets thinner and thinner. So it's not as, as much uh, air resistance. And so there's a place where they call it max Q, Maximum dynamic pressure and max acceleration. You know, one of my uh, professors in grad school, his name is Lauren Acton. And he was a physics professor at uh, Montana State. And he was a shuttle astronaut. Uh, he went up with one of the payloads back in the 90s before he became a faculty member at, at Montana State. And I, I just went and asked him what time, what, you know, what's the max acceleration in the space shuttle when it launches? He said, well, it's about 3.3 Gs. Now, fighter planes, when you take a turn, a real tight turn in a fighter plane, you know, a pilot's got to handle, you know, six, seven, eight Gs of, of ex turning acceleration. The plane can take about 20 Gs of acceleration. That's, what, that's how they build them. Um, but the space shuttle, about 3.3. All right. Now, why are the accelerations changing? To get the answer to that, we're going to ask Professor Newton all about it. So let's talk about uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his three laws of motion. Now, we're going to do some clicking here, so don't put your clickers away. We've still got a few ahead of us. All right. Now, his first law of motion is simply, it was actually discovered by Galileo. And what Galileo discovered was 
that every object retains a state of rest or a state of uniform straight line motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And Gal if you've read the textbook, you'll know that I go in, in detail about uh, the hypothetical horizontal plane with no friction that, I, that Galileo kind of idealized and used that as a, as a thinking tool about motion itself. And he came up with this, this idea that if you don't have any, any unopposed, for, uh, unopposed forces, you're just going to keep cooking along, same direction. So write down same direction, same speed. That's what um, uniform straight line motion means. Okay, straight line motion, same direction, whatever it happens to be. And uniform also means uniform speed all the way through. All right. Now, a good example, let me see if I get this thing to work here. Hold on a second. Let me see my specs. Uh, All right. Example, apple tree, apple in the apple tree. There's a pair of balanced forces on it, if you think about it. You know, one of them is the upward pull force from the stem. You know, it's attached to the branch. And so you got some upward pull force against gravity because gravity pulls straight downward. All right. And if you see an apple hanging on a branch uh, in an apple tree, which they say Sir Isaac Newton saw before one of them fell and cocked him on the head. Uh, you're seeing um, a pair of balanced forces. So in this case, it's at rest. And that's what it says in number one. Every object retains a state of rest if it's not, unless it's acted upon by an unbalanced force. Or it could, it, it's either a state of rest or a state of uniform straight line motion. Now, if the stem weakens, and you know this if, you've had, if you have a fruit tree in your backyard, you know, eventually the stem will dry out a little bit. And it'll get a little brittle. The wind blows, down she comes. Okay? The balance fails. The upward uh, pull from the stem fails due to brittleness, and, uh, and the apple will fall down out of the tree. And then the next thing you know, you're inventing universal gravitation. All right, so that's the first law. And actually, Galileo's the one that developed it. And Sir Isaac Newton was like uh, Galileo's, he, he wasn't really Galileo's uh, student, but he, he, he's the greatest physicist to come after Galileo. And he came immediately after Galileo. So. Um, an interesting guy. Now, here's another example. Think about the UCF shuttle buses, which everybody loves so much. Okay? If, if you're in a shuttle bus and the bus moves forward and you're sitting, you're standing in the aisle, all right? And, you know, sometimes it gets, I've heard that it gets so crowded on those buses, they'll, 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 they won't stop and pick up any more people. And they just go right past you. If you're one of the la one of the last stops before UCF, so you're in the aisle and the bus moves forward, you're going to lurch backward because you're going to want to stay at rest. All right. Now, if the bus turns right and you're not, everything nailed down and screwed down and bolted down on the bus is going to go right with the bus. All right. So the seats, the windows, the floor mat, the driver, because he's belted in. You know, but if you're just standing there, you're not really buckled down good enough. You're going to lurch. The bus goes to the right. You're going to want to keep going straight ahead. So what that means is you bump your left hip into the seat to your left. All right. So if you change the direction of motion or you change the speed, um, you're you, and if you're not bolted down or strapped in, uh, you're going to 
experience Newton's first law and, you know, lurch either backwards or forwards, left or right, depending on, you know, what direction or, you know, how the velocity of the bus changes. All right. So you stabilize yourself fore and aft. That's for increase in speed or decrease in speed. And then port and starboard, that's for turning. You know, you, so, you, you know, you hold on to the seats to your left and right. And hopefully that, you know, will help you um, uh, survive the ride. And, you know, those shuttle bus drivers, oh, my goodness. They drive like maniacs, some of them. You know, like, did you ever notice that? They're just like. You know, they, they really jerk those buses around and they try to, I think they try to, they train them to find all the potholes in the road and then go right through them. So I don't know, but it certainly seems that way. All right. So Galileo, he, another insight from the first law is you can separate the motion of an object and so, for instance, a cannonball or a football, you can separate the up-down motion where there is an unbalanced force, gravity, and the left-right motion where there isn't an unbalanced force. Here's a good picture of it. All right. Now, this is a, a football player passing the, an old-fashioned, you know, like 50 years ago. I wonder who made this diagram. That looks like, you know, like from the 1950s. Anyways, so the quarterback, look at the quarterback with his arm out here like this. Uh, so he throws the ball downfield to the receiver, and look at those light blue arrows. All right. The quarterback lofts the ball. He puts a little air underneath it, as they say. All right. So that means he gives it a little bit of vertical velocity, at least to start. Also, He's heaving it down the field, so he's giving it some horizontal velocity. So this, this arrow here, notice that in this diagram, it's a good diagram. Those horizontal arrows are all the same size. And why is that? There's no such thing as horizontal gravity. Gravity is only downward. So if you separate the horizontal motion from the vertical motion, you can simplify things nicely. You know, all your velocity arrows are the same size all the way through. But the vertical arrows, now look at that. It starts out up here with a, this first image with a lot of upward velocity. But it's going upward, so it loses some. And right at the top, look at this. The third picture of the football right here where my cursor is, it's got zip zap for vertical velocity arrow, okay? So it's not going up. It's not going down. It stopped for that instant. At, at least it stopped in the vertical dimension. It's still going horizontally, you know, whatever the speed is, you know, 20 meters per second or something like that, all right? So, you know, so like Brett Favor – had just about the best heater in uh, football, although I don't know who's lately who's got the best uh, the best uh, fastball in football. I don't think it's this Mahomes guy for Kansas City, but has anybody heard who's got the best the best uh, fastball in uh, football? Nobody. Patrick Mahomes. Okay. He's he's got he's got an infinite range of speed. Some of those some of those passes he was throwing the other day is unbelievable. Anyways, so so now the vertical. Now look at this on the second half of the trajectory. Now you're starting to get downward blue arrows. All right, because it got to the top of the arc. Now it's starting to head down to the receiver. All right. And those arrows get bigger and bigger, but they're downward, right? So this is one of the things that Galileo was able to say. If, if it's really true that an object will continue in motion, 
unless an unopposed force affects it, then you can split vertical and horizontal. So he was thinking about uh, cannonballs and stuff like that. But, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's for us, it's easy to see it in this picture uh, of football. All right, now at the end of Chapter 2, if you have your textbook, um, you'll see how the equations of motion combine to make a para, uh, parabola, which was one, another one of uh, Galileo's uh, discoveries. You know, nobody knew if the, the trajectory of a projectile, you know, is it, a, is, it a, uh, is it an ellipse? Is it a circle? Does it go straight up and then straight down? You know, there, there was all kinds of confusion. But and here's, here's some of the diagrams from that. Um, and so Galileo said, yeah, it's, it's a parabola, which is a very precise form of uh, a curve, a geometric curve. All right, let's try some more. We're going back to multiple choice. Let's see if I can do this. I got this instructor's clicker here. Let's see if I can. Uh, let's see. Okay. Next question. This blue car moves to the right at constant speed. Which of the statements is correct? It is? Oh, my goodness. All right. I guess I got to do this. All right. Cancel that one. Uh, all right. Hit the refresh key again. Let me try this one. Multiple choice. I think we're multiple choice the rest of the way today. And notice that you can't vote for F. All of the above includes none of the above. So that one's, that one's no good. All right, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And let's see if I can display results. Okay. Uh, let's see. Correct answer is B. Okay, good. And here's a... Here's a little bit of a, you know, go ahead and make a sketch. There's a dot to represent the car. And so if you say that it's moving right at constant speed, that's like saying that the velocity, uh, initial velocity vector um, is 10.5 meters per second, comma, rightward, for example. All right, so that'd be about, that'd be about 25 miles an hour, maybe. 20 something miles an hour, so it's just kind of poking along. All right, so that's what it means. So if it's moving at constant speed to the right, then you don't have any unbalanced forces acting on it. Let's keep going. All right, you observe a can of Pepsi. All right. It's at rest on a tabletop. Which is true, A, B, C, or D? Ten seconds to vote, starting now. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. 
Uh, whoa, looks like we got a uh we got some explaining to do. All right, let's think about this. Is it true that there are no forces acting on this soda pop can? I see a bunch of people. What force is acting on it? Gravity. Okay, so at least one. So you got gravity. All right, B, is there more than one vertical force acting on it? Yeah. Upward force from the table. Yeah, because it's at rest. So the tables, you know, so you can't make a table made of water because the water wouldn't give it any upward push force. Question. It's got to be something rigid. The rig so make a note, rigidity force upward. Because we consider a force because it doesn't turn off. It, gravity doesn't turn, you know, if you're walking around, every step you take, you end up back on the ground. You don't go flying off into, you know, if if, if you were in a, in a if, if you were walk if your muscles did the same thing, up on the space shuttle, if you were out in a spacesuit and over, you know, like walking along the, the top of the space station or something, and you did all the same things with your muscles, you go flying out of the space. There has to be a stopping point. That's correct. That's the Earth. And the Earth is, you know, rigid. But think about it. If you're if you're up on top of a cliff and you just you know like in you know Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote you know you walk off the end of the cliff and then you know Wiley e. Coyote looks around and stuff and he says help and then he starts going downward you know so you walk over the edge of the cliff there's no more cliff there to hold you up the air won't hold you up so the the difference is there has to be some kind of a rigidity force you know so this table up here. You know, it's got enough rigidity force to hold anything short of an elephant, all right? You know, an elephant will break it down. But, you know, everything that's on there, those water bottles and that whatever the sweater that is and stuff, it's got – and you know what it is? The, the surface, the material that you make the table out of, it's, it's like um, all the atoms and molecules bind together in kind of a network. And so if you put something down on it, it's like stepping onto a trampoline. You know, the trampoline will go down a little bit, but eventually it'll stop because the, the springs are pulling back, you know. And it's the same. It, the only thing is with something like this, the springs are so tight, you can't see that, you know, you can't see that it's dipping in. You know, like a trampoline, you can see it because it dips, you know, four yeah, or five inches. Yeah, well, the thing is, you can you can cool ice down below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Sure, it matters because if you want to if you want to then melt it, it's different to to take a gram of ice, water ice, at zero degrees Fahrenheit, and turn it into a gram of water, you know, at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so you can drink it. Um, it it takes more energy to do that in, than if it's a gram of water exactly at 32. Okay. So it, you know, you're, you're, you're doing good to think about it in those terms. So I applaud you for that. At any rate, let's, let's look at these you guys got a question. It's, it's all right. I mean, I, I, I want you to ask questions. Good. All right. Uh, only one vertical force acting on it? No. So it has more than one vertical force. Uh, has only ver horizontal. What's? There's no horizontal forces acting on it. 
You know, it's just vertical. You know, unless there was some air blowing through there, you know, you know, you might have a little bit of air resistance, but otherwise, no. All right, so let's keep going here. Here's your answer. And here are the two forces. Okay, so the black arrow represents the upward rigidity force. And I drew it so that with the arrows at the center of mass of the can of Pepsi, the tail of the arrow, and then the white arrow downward, that's gravity, with the tail of the arrow right at the center of mass of the can of Pepsi. All right. So there's no delta V. It's at rest. And so for since it's no delta V, there's no acceleration. There's no acceleration. There's no unbalanced external force. Everything balances. All right. So the sign of <laughs> external forces of some kind is acceleration, right, which we can measure. You know, make some distance measurements, make some time measurements, get some velocities. If the velocities are changing, you're accelerating. Therefore, you know that you've got some kind of a force. All right, now, Newton's second law is, all right, what happens if you do have unbalanced forces? You're going to accelerate, as I just said. So what you do is you add up all the forces. And if there's anything that doesn't balance, you know, up with down, left with right, then that's called the net force. All right. So if I if I pull 100 newtons, 100 units of force to the left and somebody else pulls 90 units to the right, then the net force is 10 uh, units to the left. All right. So, for instance, Dwight Howard and LeBron James. Um, let's say that uh, Dwight Howard pulls 100 units to the right, and there's his arrow, and then LeBron James, weenie that he is. Uh, I hate LeBron James, so I make him the weenie every time. Um, 80 newtons leftward. Now, on this one, write down minus 80 to symbolize or to encode, express that it's a leftward arrow. And we'll try to be doing that. You know, so a positive, Deanna, is going to be rightward, positive number, and leftward is going to be a negative number. Okay? And just try to remember that. Okay, so 100 plus a negative 80 is equal to positive 20, and that's your net. And so you can replace those two big arrows with one smaller arrow equal to the excess force that Dwight Howard exerts over LeBron James, the notorious weenie. All right. Now, the more push you have, the more acceleration. All right, so that's like if you have a grocery cart at Publix and you have Arnold Schwarzenegger pushing it, you can get a lot of acceleration. But if you have a little shrimpy first grader, you know, you can get some acceleration, but it's not going to be a whole lot, all right? Because Arnold has more push. He's got a little bit bigger moose schools than a little shrimpy first grader, all right? Also, more kilograms of mass, less acceleration, all right? The mass uh, that you measure is going to um, try to oppose the change in the velocity state, the acceleration. So getting back to Publix, if you have a, a, a grocery cart that's uh, loaded with, uh, you know, like canned vegetables, you know, stuff from the canned uh, vegetable aisle, you know, soup and beans and all that stuff. It's really heavy, right? If you load it up with that stuff and then you go to the, uh, let's see, you go to the cereal aisle and you load up an, an identical cart to the same level with boxes of cereal, all right? So much less mass, much easier, much lighter. So you will be able to push both of them, 
but the one that accelerates more is the cereal boxes. The one because it's less, you know, less kilograms of mass in there. All right. Now the the law that expresses this relationship, second law, acceleration equals net force divided by the mass. Mass measured in kilograms. And there, there's it's written. Here's another way to write it. F net equals MA. And this formula, F equals MA, is every engineering student that you may know, they're constantly thinking about. Any engineering majors in here? One. Uh, constantly thinking about F equals MA. You know, because F equals MA is always true. It's Newton's second law. And, you know, engineers are trying to build stuff so that it doesn't accelerate or that it does accelerate where they want it to and stuff. So they got to use uh, F, F equals MA out the wazoo. All right. So if you ever want to uh, mystify, if you have a friend that's an engineering major uh, and, you know, that you know, sometimes engineering majors can be really irritating. You know, like they think they know everything. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. So an engineer major, you know, just go up while they're doing their homework. Just go up to the, you know, just go up behind them and say, oh, yeah, okay, F equals MA, got it. And they'll they'll turn around and look at you and they'll think, how the heck did they figure that out? Because it's always true. So you can really befuddle your enemies if one of your enemies is an, is a, uh, or your friends is, a, is an engineering major. All right, so over here on the right, uh, up on top, upper right corner, A equals delta V over delta T. Definition of acceleration. Change of velocity divided by elapsed time, delta T. Uh, middle, F equals MA, Newton's second law. So really, Newton's second law can be rewritten as this formula down in the bottom right. F equals M times delta V over delta T. All right. Now, all three of those things can be measured. Delta V can be measured with distance and time measurements. Elapsed time can be is a pair of distant, uh, time measurements. Mass is measured in kilograms in a scale or something. And this last version of Newton's second law is quite informative for us because um, here are the, the measurements you need. We'll go into the mass measurements in a minute. You know, and so you calculate velocities and accelerations and so forth. But the interesting thing is that the stop, it, you know, if it's something that's coming to a stop, you know, if somebody pushes a, a, uh, a, a grocery cart towards you, and it's loaded with uh, cereal or anything else, and you want to bring it to a stop, you got to push the other way to stop it. And you can bring it to a stop. The stopping time is in the numerator, delta T. That's the elapsed, that's the interaction time. The amount of time it takes you to stop something is delta T in this formula. All right, so if you have a, a lot of stopping time, that means you're really struggling to stop that grocery cart. And that means you get in the in the bottom right corner. That means you have a big denominator, and that means the quotient is smaller, All right? So smaller stopping force, All right? Big denominator, small stopping force. So that's like a little first grader trying to stop that big grocery cart versus uh, Arnold. Uh, he is, he's going to have a very short stopping time because he's got a lot of muscles, all right? So his stopping time is going to be less. You know, and here's another example, if you think about it. It's kind of a bad example, but if you're in a car and you stop, you know, you're driving a car at 20 miles an hour or something, and you run into a snow drift up north, um, your car will come to a stop uh, fairly gently. You won't damage the car. And it'll take, you know, like half a second or a second to stop, depending on your speed, okay? But if you're going, you know, 5, 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, it'll bring you gently to a stop, depending on how deep the snow is and 
you know, stuff like that. Versus if you run into a brick wall, you stop like that. And, you know, your car gets all blazed up. You, you total out your car. So the stopping force on the car when it's a brick wall is reflected in the fact that the stopping time is so small. Stopping time, small, brick wall, big force, bent up front end, destroyed front end. Stopping force, small, snow drift, big stopping time, no problem. Just get towed out of the ditch and you go, go on your way. Another way to look at it, you know, you're doing plyometric workout at the gym, you know, and, you know, you got to bend your knees when you land. Um, and the reason that bending your knees is good is because it increases the stopping time. You know, when you jump off the box or jump on the box, either way, really, um, you flex your, your knee, you flex at the knees, and that gives you an extra half second of stopping time. That's easier on your knees, okay? Versus if you landed stiff-legged from a, you know, you jump down off the box and you don't bend your knees, oh, my goodness. You're going to find yourself down at the chiropractor or the, the orthopedic surgeon in, in about five minutes, all right? So you don't want to do that. All right, next question. I clicker number... I don't know what we're on. Your liter bottle of water has a mass of, so this is using F equals MA, 1.00 kilograms. It accelerates from your pull force. Your pull force acceleration is one meter per second squared. So that's your A, that's your acceleration. What's the size of your F as in F equals MA? Is it A, B, C, or D? Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Okay, let's take a look at your answers. Yeah, pretty good. Um, the correct answer is uh, is A. Let me grade that. Um, and hey, you guys, that's the official uh, metric system unit of force. We call it the Newton, and it's equivalent to 1.000 kilogram meter per second squared. Okay, so a force of one Newton on a one kilogram object accelerates it at one meter per second squared. Now there are other units of force like the pound in the English system is actually a force measurement unit. Uh, but we're never gonna use pounds. We're only gonna, we're gonna be doing metric almost every inch of the way here. So make a note of it, that's your that's F equals MA for one and one, and that's the definition of a Newton. All right, now what's F equals MA for a 342 pound, or 342 kilogram T-Rex? Numeric question, hit the refresh key. All right. Calculate the weight force. Okay, so give me a whole number. F equals MA for 342 kilogram T-Rex. Yeah, break out your break out your calculators.
So just give me a whole number of newtons. Thirty seconds. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Okay. Um, anybody get that? Thirty-three fifty-two. Let's see. Let's see what your answers are here. Yeah. A lot of you. Thirty-three fifty-two. Uh oh, somebody went thirty-three fifty-one. Uh, somebody went thirty-three fifty-one point six. Okay, didn't quite round off right. All right, now. Um, it's time to go. So let's just click through this stuff. We'll, we'll start with this about the, uh, mass measurements. Uh, here's your assignment. It'll, it'll be, uh, up a little bit later today. Um, due at 10 30 AM sharp on Thursday. Okay. You're dismissed. Yeah. Are all the homework assignments going to be on web courses or are they sometimes going to be?